Welcome. Uh, we're delighted that you've uh, come to the UNU website. We're coming to you from Tokyo this evening. My name is David Malone. I'm <coughs> rector of the UN University. The university is active in 15 locations on all five principal continents. Our headquarters is here in Japan. And today we've had uh, the great privilege of having a guest from UN headquarters who runs the legal team at the UN. He's an Under Secretary General of the UN, legal advisor to the Secretary General, uh, and directs the Office of uh, Legal Affairs. Uh, he's Portuguese. He has a very rich background in a very short number of years. Uh, he's worked for the Portuguese government as a foreign service uh, person but also as a chief of staff of a minister. He has worked in the private sector in uh, his country. He has worked in Brussels extensively for his country, uh, mm. uh, in the European Union as well. And today, uh, quite recently, perhaps a year ago, he moved uh, to the United Nations. Earlier today, he was meeting with some of our students and fellows in Tokyo. We'll have a public event this evening, and our brief discussion now simply previews what we'll be talking about this evening. So going back to something, uh, Miguel, that we were talking about a bit earlier, uh, when people think of the UN, they tend to think of war, famine, disaster, epidemics. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one's mm -hmm. imagination tends to default to conflict, situations of dire distress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but of course, law at the UN doesn't simply address conflict. It addresses much more. And I wanted to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good way to start. Let me first thank you for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure, of course. Uh, and it's true. There is a certain perception that uh, associates the UN exclusively with conflict and with uh, natural disasters. Mm. Um, but uh, we cannot forget what the UN has been doing since 1945, and uh, mostly in human rights and development. Those are very, very important areas of activity of the United Nations. Uh, in some aspects, I think that the UN has contributed really to change the world we live in today. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's also a bit unfair, this perception uh, of uh, thinking of the UN uh, mostly in terms of peace and security. Uh, unfortunately, that leads also to an, too, too much of an identification of the UN work with the Security Council. Um, and that uh, sometimes uh, makes people express a certain frustration uh, with the work of the UN. But um, our universe is, is much broader than peace and security and conflict. and Although these areas are absolutely fundamental, mm. it's absolutely fundamental the humanitarian work, for instance, um, bringing even food to people. Uh, but uh, we have to think of the broader picture. Great. Uh, now, uh, on the peace and security issues, the principal <coughs> uh, organ of the UN is the Security Council. And issues of law come up quite a lot in the Security Council. Uh, different members of the council have different views themselves mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. uh, the law pertaining to a given situation or a given initiative. And then you are often <coughs> called upon to advise the secretary general and through him sometimes the council on matters of law. And that probably is rather different from the type of law that you practiced in Brussels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you see, um, it is different, but also uh, in Brussels, in the European Union, and mostly in the work of the Council of the European Union, uh, we have to work on a very uh, political environment. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, when member states sit in Brussels around the table to negotiate uh, important uh, topics as uh, uh, fisheries or the financial program for the the next years or whatever uh, institutional issue may, uh, that can come to their uh, 
to their hands, uh, it's much uh, tougher than people imagine. Mm. It's not an exchange of diplomatic niceties. Yeah. Sometimes it gets extremely tough. And uh, working in Brussels, you also have to work with the political leaders of your own country and try to understand the political environment of other countries. And so, in a way, it was a good preparation to work in New York. Mm. Now, uh, the difference is that instead of thinking European, you have to think global yeah. at the world scale. And uh, you have to get familiar with uh, other political cultures and other uh, other uh, uh, political uh, uh, behaviors that uh, you would probably not be too familiar in uh, in the work in, in Europe, but it's the same. It's operating on a very political environment, uh, and is to understand what is requ required from someone who has to advise, in terms of law, the political decision maker, and uh, in this case, the secretary general, also as a, a decision maker in the sense that. He has to take positions, or he may wish to take a position. Now, the legal counsel does not engage very frequently in a direct way with the, with the Security mm -hmm. Council. Uh, I'm not even sure that the members of the Security Council uh, would want the legal, the, the, the legal counsel to be too, too closely involved with their work. Yes. Um, they have the perception that the Security Council itself is bound by the law, mm -hmm. and that, that's very clearly established uh, in the Charter. I think it's Article 24 that uh, says very clearly that the Security Council has to discharge its functions in accordance with the principles and purposes of the Charter. Respect for international law is one of the, the principles. They're bound by the law, um, and um, some of their uh, very political discussions as also a legal di the dimension uh, that that makes the work very interesting, especially when they disagree, and that happens uh, frequently. Uh, sometimes under the cover of legal arguments, that does not mean necessarily that the discussion taking place is a, is of a legal nature, but also sometimes you know the legal argument is um, is a cover for other. Uh, uh, political challenges that are taking place in, within the Security Council. Indeed. Now, one thing people tend to overlook in the realm of law at the UN is the extent to which a great deal of normative development has occurred mm -hmm. within the UN, as you were saying, mm -hmm. since its creation. Large number of <laughs> treaties in the human rights field, but even the economic law field, the uh, yes. law of the sea, which you've been yes. discussing here yes. in Tokyo. Yes. And so all of this treaty-based uh, law centered in a way, at least negotiated under the UN mm -hmm. umbrella and in some ways still centered on the UN, uh, is I think one of the major innovations since the Second World War in international relations. We have much more treaty law now than we did before the Second World War. Does that figure in your work much? It does, it does. And I would, uh, I would like to add is, is one of the major achievements mm -hmm. uh, of the United Nations. And it also um, it shows, uh, in a way, how much the international order has changed uh, since 1945. Because if we, if we look into the past, um, most uh, of international law was either customary law or bilateral treaties, you know, mostly in, in, in trade relations yes. between two countries or matters of war and peace. Um, and it's only after 1945 that you have this uh, eruption of this multilateralism. Uh, I think more or less roughly we have 560 multilateral treaties concluded under the auspices of, um, of the United Nations. And some of them are absolutely instrumental and fundamental in the international order. Uh, so I think that's one of the big achievements. I take that um, part seriously in the sense that we keep promoting multilateralism. And uh, each year during the General Assembly, there is um, uh, one event which is called the treaty event. It's basically org uh, organized by my office. And in this event, we invite states to come and sign uh, and deposit ratifications of multilateral treaties. 
uh, and uh, for instance, last year, it was my first year as the United Nations Legal Council, we had an absolute bestseller with the arms trade treaty. Oh yes, of course. It was, you know, very, yes. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> controversial treaty, um, which entered into force mm. this year. But there was, a, there was a, a, an important, I think, a very important multilateral mm. treaty, at least for the majority of countries. So um, contributing to this um, multilateralism, promoting multilateralism, promoting uh, uh, international treaties, it's something I take seriously, but also many of my colleagues uh, take it very seriously. Uh, someone dealing with the rights of children will uh, extensively promote all multilateral instruments concerning rights of children. By the way, the, I think that at, at, by now, there are only three states that have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the <laughs> Child. I'm not going to say <laughs> which, which ones. Um, but um, yes, it's a very important, uh, important. Um. Now, a number of years ago, I think it was Boutroskelli who appointed the first High Commissioner for Human Rights, mm -hmm. and uh, the first High Commissioner did a good job getting the office off the ground, but mm -hmm. didn't make a lot of waves on mm -hmm. behalf of mm -hmm. human rights. Mm -hmm. Since then, we've had a number <coughs> of very activist human rights yes. High Commissioners. We have a very impressive new one in mm. uh, Zaid Rad uh, from Jordan. Mm. And so uh, human rights is not simply dealt with now only as a matter of implementation of various treaties, but there's also a more political, a more advocacy function yes. that the current Secretary General has also taken on quite a bit. So we have the High Commissioner yes. advocating human rights a lot. We also have the Secretary General yes. from a different part of the world, Asia, uh, advocating human rights very strongly, yes. it seems to me. Yes, yes. I think that we are um, probably entering in a new phase of uh, human rights uh, law and human rights promotion. Again, I think that, that that's one of the major achievements of the United Nations. Mm. Is the old, idea of human rights is born uh, in, after 1945 uh, with this uh, systematic nature. Um, I was participating in a meeting uh, the other day and, and someone mentioned that um, the, the African delegates to the San Francisco Convention had to travel on a different compartment in the train because mm -hmm. they were, this is amazing, yes. this is amazing. Uh, things that were an uh, acceptable uh, 50 years, 70 years, but also 30 years ago are no longer unacceptable. Mm. And I think that's very much uh, the role of the United Nations, Secretary General, High Commission, mm. in promoting, promoting human rights, in advocating uh, human rights, and in some situations denouncing abusers. Mm. Uh, some of the human rights commissioner pre uh, speeches may be very uncomfortable for, uh, may, may make some states very uncomfortable. Mm. It's part of the job description. Uh, I hope we'll keep having uh, brave mm. high commissioners and brave uh, secretary generals of the United Nations in this uh, field of promotion of, uh, of human rights. I well, think I think they've, they've set, a, so uh, far, a very impressive standard yes. on that front just as the High Commissioner for Refugees Office, in a more low-key way sometimes, mm -hmm. has become really a mainstay of international relations. And that underscores, again, the multiplicity mm -hmm. of UN missions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that um, uh, there are agencies, uh, sometimes just offices, looking after many dimensions mm -hmm. of uh, human life, human problems around the globe, mm -hmm. all of which have legal uh, yes. dimensions yes. as well, keeping you busy. I wanted to ask you finally about uh, the, in a sense, the rise about of arguments about sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, sovereignty is something each state cares about very strongly in terms of its own sovereignty. Yes. Whether you're Luxembourg or <coughs> the United States, your own sovereignty really matters. Uh, 
but the sovereignty of others is viewed rather differently mm -hmm. today than it might have been in mm -hmm. the 19th century mm -hmm. or even quite recently. Mm -hmm. And has this shifting um, view of sovereignty in a sense complicated your life in the Office of Legal Affairs and uh, do you play into the arguments on mm -hmm. sovereignty? Well, uh, this is a very interesting discussion and an excellent topic for a PhD. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me start by saying that the way, uh, I'm not speaking as an international civil mm. servant right now, mm. but sovereignty is a, is a tricky concept. Mm. The way an American uh, thinks, or thinks of sovereignty is certainly different the way a Portuguese thinks mm. what sovereignty is. In the sense, we're a small country, not very powerful economically, without a significant military force. We have transferred many of our sovereign powers to the European Union. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, this generates a lot of different mm -hmm. perceptions of what sovereignty is. Um, and th there's a, a, a very important separation between permanent members of the Security Council and, and non-permanent members. That also generates different visions on sovereignty. What I think is that since 1945, we are still in some, somehow in an age of Aquarius of mm. international law, of the international legal order. We do not know uh, what exactly we're leading to, but we feel that there is a, a lot of difference, um, or very many differences vis-a-vis -vis what, what existed before 1945. 1945, we had more or less an absolute concept of sovereignty. Uh, and uh, very few limitations to this concept of sovereignty and limitations imposed by law existed. Mm -hmm. And uh, what changed after 1945 is this idea that an absolute notion of sovereignty is no longer accepted. This, this notion has to be limited by human rights, mm -hmm. uh, by the idea that states uh, more than rights have also the responsibility to protect their own people. So all this debate that is taking place has certainly changed. Um, I don't think that it has complicated my life as legal counsel because I also like to think of the United Nations as more than states. There are many United Nations. There's the United Nations of staff members like myself there's the United Nations of member states, but there's also the United Nations of NGOs and citizens and people who cooperate and collaborate with us. So the United Nations is very broad, mm -hmm. you know? And all these different actors uh, do not necessarily share the same vision. Hmm? Our system of international governments is changing the way we're working, but also at the national level, mm. you know, more and more non-state actors have a voice, are important, the way that national governments have to deal with their own constituencies are changing, and the same happens with us in, at the United Nations. And in many ways, when treaties are signed, one yields some sovereignty, and that isn't yes. new. Yes. So yes. Uh, uh, it's more, <laughs> as you were saying, an evolution that's yes. accelerated since the yes. Second yes. World yes. War. An interesting and direction. some of these treaties creates rights mm. that the individuals can claim vis-a-vis -vis their own states, and that's very important. Absolutely. We've had with us tonight Miguel de Serpas Ores, who is Under Secretary General of the UN, the UN's Legal Council. Uh, he met with UNU students earlier today. We're having a public event in Tokyo this evening, but we did want to share with uh, those who join us online uh, one or two of the issues we'll be discussing later, as well as others which the audience may have on mind. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, David. <laughs>